Hello and welcome to the Uplifting Impact Podcast. I am Deanna Singh, Chief Change Agent for Uplifting Impact, and I am so excited to be hosting you again for another deep dive into our journey around how we make the world more diverse, equitable, and inclusive. Today, I am talking to Mr. Will Murphy. So just to give you a little bit of background on on Will, Will leads the diversity and inclusion and belonging for Amgen's global R&D organization of 4,500 plus employees with a deep commitment to fostering a culture of belonging where diversity is celebrated and inclusion is the norm. And I love that where inclusion is the norm. I think that should be the gold standard of what we're trying to achieve. Um, So Will's had a lot of different roles. He's a variety of different HR leadership positions, including two HR technology startups, AbbVie and Netflix. He also co-founded and led as CEO of of a boutique HR consulting startup. He's certified as a career coach and a NASM certified personal trainer and holds a master's degree in human resources from the University of Illinois at Champaign-Urbana. Outside of his work, Will is a fitness and adrenaline junkie and an avid Chicago sports fan. (laughs) He's pointing to his uh, Chicago, uh, his Chicago stuff behind him. And the bike. And uh, the the bike. bike. (laughs) (laughs) All, all, All the fun things. Um, well, it's so wonderful to have you on our show. Thanks for being oh, here. I'm just us. grateful to be here today. Thank you, Dina. Yeah, absolutely. So one of the things uh, that we wanted to start off with, and this is sometimes a question we just like to pop in, is what's bringing you joy this week? Like, what is what is making you uh, smile? Yeah, thanks for asking the question. Um, love starting positive. Um, on a personal note, um, I do have a birthday coming up. i turning Scotty Pippen, 33. Um, So back to my Chicago uh, Bulls roots. And my wife uh, is not the best at keeping secrets, but this time she's been building a lot of energy and excitement and surprise around my birthday this year. Um, So I'm I'm really looking forward to that. It's been a lot of fun to just chat with her and we go on evening walks with our two giant Huskies and just catch up on the day. It's usually the best time of my day. I find uh, that hour of decompression and conversation with the most meaningful relationship in my wife uh, with my wife to be, you know, again, the, the most engaging part of my week and building this excitement towards my birthday week has been a lot of fun for me personally. That's awesome. You and I celebrate uh, birthdays around the same time. So we'll have to talk about that offline because I want to, I want to hear some of the things you think are going to happen. Awesome. That sounds like a plan. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Wonderful. So one of the things that we mentioned in your bio is that you have had the opportunity to work at a lot of different kinds of organizations. And I know one of the things that, you know, a lot of our listeners are often wondering is in all those different spaces, right? It, it, you at some point, I'm assuming, okay, so tell me if I'm wrong, at some point, you probably have met a little bit of resistance as it relates to diversity, equity, and inclusion, or in implementing an idea or a policy. I'm just wondering, like, how you have handled resistance in the past. Yeah, thanks for the question. And uh, I'm sure all my fellow DEI colleagues can relate that this is absolutely a challenge. And, you know, what I'd like to do first is just recognize the reasons for pushback is that this is a deeply sensitive and emotionally charged space. And the one thing I like to talk about within my current organizational context to grab the attention of a lot of our staff um, being in the biotech industry is I like to say that human behavior and diversity, equity, and inclusion work in the workplace is oftentimes um, more challenging than drug development, right? So it puts them in an interesting kind of attention grabbing position to ask the question as to why. And the reason is, and I've listened to a lot of great Brene Brown podcasts and the guests that she's brought on. And what they explain is that human behavior is erratic, emotional, unpredictable, hard uh, hard to understand, and varies every day. Um, So when we're talking about DEI and and those sensitivities, there's a variety of reasons that we, we can tend to see pushback. One may be around denial, right, saying this isn't really a problem for folks who might just simply not understand the lived experiences of different intersectional identities or demographic groups or underrepresented uh, groups within the organization. Another might be around derailing, right? There's a lot of other 
existing challenges within a business. So what makes DEI the most important aspect or an aspect worth addressing when you're looking at a wide slate of challenges yeah. to focus on, many of which business leaders are focused on solving because it's business. And then the last is around disengagement, right? Those folks who may say, this isn't my problem. Um, and so the way to overcome pushback, at least what's worked for me personally, um, is really first and foremost, communicating to obtain buy-in and, and helping all folks across the organization, regardless of their uh, personal identity, helping them understand that they have a seat at the table. Um, you know, we of course see a lot of folks from underrepresented groups um, or non-dominant groups opt in to a lot of diversity work. There's passion, there's lived experiences that have led to them wanting to play a part. Um, but then you of course have other groups, the dominant groups that may not have had that same type of experience. Perhaps they come with privilege um, and, and don't fully understand those experiences of other groups. And so for me personally, what I like to do is leverage what I've built within my current organization, which is our diversity and inclusion champion network, an incredibly diverse group um, in all definitions of the term, both the diversity you can see and the diversity you can't across a global enterprise. Um, as you shared in my introduction, I support an organization of 4,500 people. And so cultural competence and lived experience and understanding is a key aspect of my work. I spend lots of time speaking to folks across the entire network that we've built, as well as folks outside of that diversity champion network who are living experiences both personally and professionally within their locale, right? Whether that's in our European region, um, you know, our, our JPAC region, our Latin American region, all that come with microcosms of culture and different types of experiences. And I use that information and elevate that to our leaders to help them understand the true experiences of those folks. I also like to use data because I am in an R&D science-based organization. So speaking their language, right? Understanding the aspects that are attractive to them that grab their attention um, and leveraging said data, whether it's empirical research around diversity uh, and inclusion experiences, strategies, uh, benchmarking, how other companies are managing it, as well as that qualitative feedback from the bottom up that's a piggyback or a deeper dive off of our annual or quarterly, excuse me, engagement surveys all of that data, information, and research uh, enables me to communicate my leaders to obtain buy-in into initiatives. It also en uh, enables me to foster empathy because I'm creating broader awareness of those experiences. Oftentimes, it's just simply um, a, a lack of understanding from a lack of lived experience that feeds into that lack of awareness. It's not their fault unless they're proactively engaging in those conversations and getting to know their staff and learning more about those experiences. And what I found is generally speaking, when you share those experience, positive, negative, or anything in between, and people come to the table and get to know one another on a more personal level, or I'm advocating on their behalf via this roll up of qualitative experience, information, and feedback, um, that then turns into more empathy, which then turns into more buy-in. The last piece I'll share um, is really around inviting folks to the table. Again, everybody having a seat and actively engaging them in DEI efforts. And so that includes all layers of an organization from our most senior executives to our most junior employees because uh, within an enterprise, within an organization, every individual can own and support and enable a more diverse and inclusive environment. And, and we have that accountability and that ownership day to day. It's oftentimes, and this is where sometimes these big initiatives can get misconstrued in an enterprise where business leaders may assume that we need to do really high effort, high lift effort um, and initiative. And instead, what we find is it's the day to day interactions that define culture, right? It's what's happening behind the scenes when no one's looking. And so by inviting everybody to the table, empowering them with tips and advice and guidance and coaching on how to create more inclusive spaces, how to be a stronger ally, um, and, and how to create a sense of comfort and safety and sharing those experiences, again, helps to obtain buy-in when we're looking at really high, highly visible, high effort initiatives 
or really small uh, effort, but also high impact initiatives and anything. That's so important. awesome. There's so many things that I would like to kind of like go back and unpack in what you just said and kind of call call out a little bit, sure. because I think I just want to make sure that, you know, people heard, um, they heard these things. And I think one of the big things that I really appreciate is this idea of how when you're having conversations and you said it in two different ways, you said, you know, when I uh, go and I talk to people, one of the first things that I will say is, okay, you know what, this is actually more challenging, or this is how it lines up with the work that you do on a day to day basis, right. And I, I think that's brilliant, right. And I, but I, so I wanted to call it out, because no matter what sector you're in, there is a way for you to use the language that already exists within the organizations and the things that people are already kind of comfortable with and have a shared understanding of to help place right where this diversity, equity and inclusion work falls in. And so that was that's really cool, right, like to be able to say like, hey, this is the work that we do every day, right? We are trying to build, um, you know, medicine, and we're trying to we're trying to do we're we're trying to do these things. And as we're trying to do these things, this is also very similar. But it's here's how it's different, and here and here's what it means, and here's why it's important to the to that work. We often talk about the fact that so much, especially in the healthcare industry, you know, so much of like what people are dealing with has to do with their ability to feel like they're included, right? Like that these two things. And so just understanding even, you know, how you do that. I think that's awesome. So I would encourage, like, take away. Absolutely. And you make a really good point there, just to bridge the two is we oftentimes think about in, in the biotech industry is we're creating new medicines for severe disease states and unmet needs on a global scale. Well, what's our global citizenship? How do we break those demographics down? And, and then how do we ensure that we have folks in the organization that understand those experiences of all communities, regardless of race, gender, ethnicity, but also in nuance? Um, so we're invested deeply in the health equity space, ensuring that we have diversity and representation in our clinical trials. And we marry that narrative with the internal diversity, equity, and inclusion work that we do. So there's a very clear synergy between our business strategy and our internal culture and bringing those strong ties together. So I just really appreciate that, um, you know, very on point uh, aspect that you pulled out. <laughs> but I think it's pitch. awesome. Like, I think it's so important because if you can make that connection for people, it, it helps, it helps like ground and, you know, not to... Uh, harp on kind of the, totally. the healthcare space. But I do think it's also just important to understand when, if we don't have this cultural competency, when we think we're putting something out into the marketplace and we put it out the same way everywhere, right? That, that could actually be detrimental to us because it might not be received the same way everywhere. We, we've seen that happen again and again, not just in the healthcare industry, but especially there, right? Where we're different cultures have different kinds of expectations or how we introduce it, how we talk about things. So Anyway, That's so that great. was one thing I wanted to pull out, but there's more. Well, you, you, you gave us a lot, so I'm, there's other things. The other thing that I really appreciated is this idea of how buy-in, having a seat at the table, and empathy, like, all work together. So as you were talking, I kept drawing, like, lines, right? Like, you'd say buy-in, and then I'd draw a line to empathy. And then you said, and I was just drawing, and so now I have just this hat mess on my paper of uh, between those three words. But those are so important. In order for, it's almost like one begets the other, right? Like it's a continuous circle. You can't have buy-in if you don't give people the opportunity to have some empathy. But nobody's really going to have empathy if you don't give them the opportunity to engage and learn and and have a seat at the table and be invited to that table and, and get the experiences that are going to give you the empathy that leads to the buy-in. But you can't have the buy-in, if you, right? So it's just this like cool thing that if you're not thinking about all three of them, if there's a gap in that, right? If we don't have the empathy piece, it's going to be, we won't be able to achieve the other two. And I, I just thought the way you said that was just really important. How do we make sure that we're working on all of those, all those cylinders? Awesome. So that was another big point. Um, and then the third thing that I really appreciate is this conversation. And, I, you know, I would challenge everyone who's listening to think about this too. Like, what does this look like in your organization? Do you have, even if you haven't named them, do you have a champion network? You know, have you, and you do, right. And I, I'm wondering, like, do people who are listening, do they have a champion? We network? do. Because I, I bet you that even if you haven't named it, and that's a cool name, by the way, but even if you haven't named it, you probably sure. do. And so thinking about if we don't have it, how could we start naming 
Like who are our champions within the organization? And even if I don't make it really formal, even if I'm just in my mind thinking about it, if you start to identify the people who are supporting you, then it becomes much easier to think about the second question, which is how do I resource them? Right. If I know who my champions are and, and I know maybe where they might have some gaps or where, you know, where they're really, really strong and could, you know, help us press things forward, maybe even faster than what we initially anticipated. How do I resource them in a way? And so I think that makes right when you talk about like these big organizations and we have people, you have forty five hundred, we have, you know, people have ten thousand, we have people who have seventy that any number, any, any one of those numbers is big. Right. It's all based on on perspective. But how do you break that down into a way that is more manageable, right? In a way that you can really start thinking about how can I intentionally support support my team? Yeah, yeah, it's a great question. Um, and you know, we have uh, an interesting journey in in our build of our own network. And what I, I you know, talking to other companies, I would advise anything. It's harnessing the passion of your people, um, and also just being mindful of their own lived experience because this is an interesting aspect, a challenging aspect of ensuring that the folks who are opting in are willing to do so. Um, we, the last thing that we would do is trigger their own lived experiences. And so generally speaking, we provide the opt-in type of model as we're building this network. We set a tone for the organization. We inspire people to understand why these aspects of our culture are important and how fundamental enablers of our talent our culture, our relationships, and ultimately our business strategy to impact patients. And we give people the choice. And oftentimes people will opt in across a series of variables, whether they have the time available, manager support, passion for the space, um, and a willingness to come in and help create more understanding and awareness. Um, and then, of course, to your point, these are folks, the way we define it is really around the Globally advised and locally executed because we are a global matrix organization with operations across dozens of countries. We need to make sure that the strategy that we set applies at a local level. And there are aspects of diversity, equity, and inclusion that may be US oriented that aren't a fit, for example, or there may be aspects about Chinese business uh, culture that are very different from Western, um, you know, L we're based in thousands culture. Um, and so we need to understand and appreciate those nuances and those differences and empower those champions within our work to understand the grand intent, but to localize it in a way that makes sense for them. And what we find is that empowerment is the key to success and giving them the flexibility and autonomy to say, thank you for guidance. We see grand, uh, aspiration here. We're now going to localize it and those champions are also the greatest benefit that they provide us that I'm so appreciative of is the eyes to the ground, right? The network is broadly distributed um, across all these different countries, whether we're working remotely in a hybrid fashion or on site, especially in R&D where we have folks in the lab um, and, and also in our operations group where we have folks physically present in manufacturing facilities, teams um, is what leads to the best outcome. That's awesome. Well, Will, it's been so lovely chatting with you this uh, afternoon. I'm, I'm glad that we got a chance to to talk and to talk about some of these big ideas. But I like the idea. Likewise. I like, I like being able to think about, now, how do we localize it, right? So we've talked about a lot of different strategies, a lot of different ideas here. How are, how are you listeners? How are you going to localize it, right? How are you going to give your, and how are you going to give your teams the opportunity to take these big ideas and localize it for them? There is something about being inclusive in our inclusive strategies. <laughs> so, Will, if people want to get a hold of you or follow, you know, the work that you're doing, what's the best way for them to stay in contact? Yeah, thanks uh, for the opportunity to share. Uh, first and foremost, you can find on LinkedIn. I'm extremely active there and love engaging in conversations. You can DM me. We can join together. Um, you'll find me relatively active there for the sake of networking and learning from others and listening to others and understanding their perspectives. Um, and then you can also find me of course, other social media channels. You can find me on Twitter at WBMurphy89. Um, and then if you're interested in reaching out directly, I'm happy to uh, privately share additional contact information if you reach out through either of those channels and look forward to engaging in some great conversations with some like-minded, passionate folks in the DEI space. 
Wonderful. Well, thank you so very much for your time. And thank you, everyone, for joining us again for another episode of Uplifting Impact. We need more people to help us uplift the impact. And we know that in order to do so, we have to be able to share resources. So we hope that you are using this podcast as one of your resources and that you will consider sharing it with other people who are in this space and are really committed, like you said, like-minded people who are trying to do the good work out there because we would love to be able to hear their thoughts and have them join in on the conversation. If any of you who are listening have some ideas of guests or some questions that you would like to see us answer in the podcast, we encourage you to go to our website, upliftingimpact.com, or to reach out to myself or Justin Ponder on LinkedIn. We also love to hear from you and just understand kind of where you're at and maybe how you're trying to put some of these ideas into action. Those are always our favorite favorite, favorite notes. So until next week, keep on uplifting the impact. Thanks. Thanks.